as a great way to uh, end the first portion of this session. These three items, this refining by fire, and, well, you took it down. I, I wrote it down. I got it there. You got it there. And Christ, covering of Christ for old righteousness, and then the gift of the Holy Spirit representing the ISAF. That's a beautiful way to, to lead into the next two verses. So the next two verses, 19 and 21, uh, were the ones that um, the class here assigned to me. But I'd like to read them in reverse order. Okay, so I don't know if you can turn that upside down, uh, <laughs> but we'll just read them. And uh, Brother David used the ESV this morning, and I'm going to read it with the ESV. But I'm going to read verses 20 and then 19, but as Brother Kent did, I'm going to open with verse 14, because verse 14 is really important. So this is 19 and 21 reversed with verse 14. So uh, Brother Tim said... This is really simple, right? Okay, so I'm trying to simplify this. So I'm gonna read it for you so you don't have to do the transposition. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and the true witness, beginning of God's creation. And Brother Kent point out, this is Jesus talking to you and to me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Those who I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. So that's verses 20 and 19. And why would I reverse them? I really appreciated something Brother David said this morning. You know, when you look at scripture, sometimes it's easier to rearrange them if they make more sense to you. Now, at the end of Revelation, it says, don't add to, it, to the, these words. Don't take them away. But I think I have some basis from what Brother David said this morning. You can turn the verses around if it makes more sense to you. <laughs> and I want to tell you why it makes more sense to me. It, this might not make sense to you. But the reverse order to me is easier to first set the timing of what they refer to. And then what the message is. And so to look at the, the timing, it first establishes that the Lord returned. And second, describes what needs to be done by those who are living in this time. And that helps me. That might not help you. Um, and this was introduced, Brother, um, Brother Bill said, we're living in the Laodicean church. And we are. And in discussions today, I think um, we've all established that. So let's take a look at what the Lord said about his return. So these are the words of Jesus, okay? In Acts 1, 6 through 11, 6 through 11, Jesus said, so when they had come together, they asked him, our Lord, he said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he, Jesus, said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's what Jesus said. And then the account goes on. When he'd said those things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into the heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. White robes. Where did we hear that? Just a moment ago. And said, men of Galilee, why did you stand here looking to heaven? This Jesus whom you've, who was taken up from heaven will come in the same way which you saw him go into heaven. That's the angelic explanation of his leaving them. It's also the beginning of the explanation of his return. So that's what Jesus said when he left about his return added, you know, aided by the, the angels describing it. Now listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. This is in 1 Thessalonians verse, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and 4 through 6. And Paul says, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to add anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But you... 
And I think that that's talking about the church to the whole age, but our emphasis is on the Laodicean church. You have no need written for you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night and of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Brother Kent mentioned in his remarks that today there's kind of been, uh, in, in many lessons, kind of three points that have come out. And, and I, I appreciate that because I'm going to bring three more out just from what, the, what we just read. Okay. From the two accounts that we just read, this is, these are the three points that I take from them. First point, Jesus would return as a thief in the night just the way he left. And what does that mean? It means invisible to the world. The world didn't see him go. His faithful followers saw him go. That's the first point I get it from it. The second point is that no one knows the time or season that God has fixed for his return. That's what Jesus said. I take that out of it. And the third is that the church class are children of light and should be watching and waiting for this invisible return. So the third point that appeals to me is because we're children of light, we'll somehow figure out when he's returned. There's going to be some evidence of that. So the question is, are we watching? Are we watching for his return? You know, Revelation chapters two and three speak of the seven churches that the class here is involved in a study in right now. And we want to note the timing of our Lord's return in harmony with the words of Jesus and Paul that we just read. We especially want to look at the last three churches. So I want to quote from the last three churches. This is taken from Revelation 3.3. 3. It says, to the angel of the church of Sardis, says, I will come like a thief. I will come. Okay. What does will come mean to you? To me, it means it's in the future. Revelation 3.11, to the angel of the church of the Phil, of, in Philadelphia, I am coming soon. No, it's not I'm, I'm coming. It's I'm coming soon. And then in today's assigned verse, Revelation 3.20, to the angel of the church of the, in Laodicea, here I am. I'm here. I stand at the door and knock. This is our time in the churches. Jesus is knocking because he has returned. Now, it's not my assignment to explain all the details of chronology and his return and all that. Um, and it's, it's also my intent not to do that. But just to take into um, our understanding just one place where we might identify that our, G, that our Lord has returned. We wanted to look at a couple things. It actually happens to be three points from Daniel. Think of the three points that kind of help us fix a date for our Lord's return from Daniel. You remember in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. Where'd that dream come from? We know it came from the Heavenly Father. And that dream was interpreted by Daniel. We know where the inspiration for that interpretation came from. It came from our Lord. And what does it do? Daniel explains it's going to identify all this succession of major empires in the world. And at the end, you can start expecting to look for our Lord to return. Well, that's one point in Daniel. The second is the description of the time of the end. And this is, of course, in the 12th chapter, verse 4. Daniel said, many shall run to and fro, fro and knowledge shall increase. And then finally, for those who love numbers, we have um, in Daniel 12, 11, and 12, the timing of the years, 1290 years and 1335 years. And I think as Bible students, we can put those together as numbers we can depend on and signs that we can depend on that establish the date. And I think most Bible students agree that that date is 1874.
So that's the first point that hits me when I read this, that the Lord has returned and that we can see that the scriptures have actually, for most of us, we're, we're comfortable that it's given us a date that he, when he returned. But that doesn't mean anything to us if we don't prepare ourselves. I love what Brother Kent just mentioned, some of the things we have to do to make ourselves ready. Knowledge, as Brother Tim pointed out, is meaningless if you don't act rightly upon it. So with the timing and the understanding set that we're in this church of Laodicea, what, what should we do? There's another scripture that says, you know all these things. Then what manner of man ought you to be? What manner of Christians ought we to be? What's expected of us at this time? So the angel says to the church, you're lukewarm. If you're in a class and you want to get a, a high grade and your teacher looks at you and you ask him, how am I doing? He says, well, Byron, you're doing lukewarm. I, I wouldn't feel too good. I would not feel too good. That, that's not what I'm aiming for. So why is this church, the final church of the gospel age, lukewarm? Well, this is why, to me, it's easier to reverse verses 19 and 20. 20 sets the stage that we're in this, in this time frame. The Lord's here, but we have to now conform ourselves to be not lukewarm. Now, to, so we mentioned, you know, this running to and fro and increase of knowledge. And to many of us, that's a, a very clear indication of where we are in the stream of time. You know, think about where we are in the world of transportation. I think we've all read Brother Russell's comments about the speed of transportation in his day. Here's just one comment that he made about speed. Brother Russell said, for, for concluding from this prophecy in Daniel 12, 4, that sometime men would travel 50 miles an hour, Voltaire referred to Sir Isaac Newton as a poor old daughter. Scientists talking about it. Man, that, that guy's crazy. He thinks we could go 50 miles an hour sometime. Imagine if they were here today. You know, we, we look at uh, taking flights from place to place. And most commercial airlines will fly cross country in six hours. Six hours. Think of Voltaire and Isaac Newton talking about that kind of speed. Imagine what they would think if they would have seen uh, one of the supersonic jets crossing the United States. When the Concorde was put out of business, one of the last one, they start sending the, the few that were remaining to different museums around the world. One of them came to Seattle from New York. Flight time, three hours and 55 minutes, cross country. There was another military aircraft that was gonna go on display. It was in California, and they were going to fly it cross country the other direction, which is actually a little bit easier because you're going with the wind. It was called a uh, SR-71 Blackbird, and if Brother Mark Davis was here, he could give us all the details of what that was. Time of flight from California to Washington, D.C., where it was going to be put on exhibit, 68 minutes. 68 minutes, averaged a little over 2,200 miles per hour. And because I was coming to Canada, I had to flip that into kilometers per hour. So for, for our Canadian friends, that's 3,540 kilometers per hour to cross the continent, the North American continent. Now, Brother Russell also commented about how multitudes run to and fro whose grandfathers probably never traveled more than 50 miles from their birthplace. And that was common. People didn't do this. 
So how tempting to give up valuable spiritual time to use these increases of knowledge for our entertainment. How many would like to take advantage of our spiritual time, our concentrated time, and that's your main purpose, to fly around the world from here to there. Maybe once in a while, that's a good thing to do. Or if you're going to visit the brethren, Tim, Brother Tim and Sister Dawn have made two trips to Europe this year. Did they go there for, for fun? They went there to serve the brethren. So all these things that we see are for our use in helping the brethren and developing ourselves. Daniel also comments on a great increase of knowledge in the time of the end. And, you know, we've seen just amazing achievements in every facet of life from science to entertainment. And like running from to and fro, the impact has been great in earthly enjoyment, but it's been a temptation to our spiritual lives. Again, we can get so wrapped up in this, it's so easy to become lukewarm because it gives us so much free time. So many pleasant distractions are available to us. So many fun things to do with your neighbors. Sister Margie just retired and we're on a trip right now. And with the help of the Don sending us, we're making trips uh, all the way across the country and back again. But we're visiting brethren and we're in our car. But Sister Margie's friends used to talk to her all the time about, oh, you're gonna retire, it's gonna be so great. Where are you going? Because they're into, into going places. They, they travel here and there and here and there. They don't go because they're brother and there. They go for whatever entertainment is there, whatever historical references are there. And so when you think about all these things that surround us, it's little wonder that the Laodicean church was called lukewarm. Too many temptations. Our spiritual lives are easily diluted by earthly activities. So what's the remedy to the temptation of lukewarmness? Well, we get back to the reason I like to reverse it. The 19th verse says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. You know, this Greek word, Translated reprove means reproach or disgrace, put to shame, dishonor. And that was actually in verse 18 that we read this, wasn't it, Brother Kent? And the Greek word translated discipline means to train or educate like a child. And so we find guidance from Paul in Hebrews 12, 6 through 11. And this is with our amplification. In your struggles against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son who he receives. It is for discipline that you have, have to endure. And this is my words. In order to avoid lukewarmness. God is treating you as sons. What son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated and therefore all are tempted towards lukewarmness, then you're all illegitimate children and not sons. And besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not respect much more the subject of the father of spirits and live, for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best for them, but he disciplines us for good, to remain spiritually hot, my words, so that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And my addition, so trust your father's discipline is intended to keep you away from lukewarmness. The apostle James gave similar advice, which we again add to our, with our own amplification. James 1, 2 to 4, from the Phillips translation that we heard earlier today. 
When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. They will keep your spiritual life burning hot. That was my addition. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. This quality is the opposite of lukewarmness. My words. Let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed and you will find you will become men of mature character with the right sort of independence. So brethren, this is what we're doing. We realize where we are in the stream of time. We can establish our Lord is here. We can establish the fact that he is going to give us discipline. He is also showing us how we can avoid lukewarmness, the things we can do to focus on spiritually to be acceptable to him. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. I had a nice discussion with Brother um, Ben about that scripture today, about how if someone comes and knocks on your door and they want something, sometimes I just take it and they leave. Our Lord actually wants to come in and sit down with us. And there's another place in the scriptures that reminds me of a, a similar thought. And that was when Jesus was walking the road to Emmaus and he comes across two men. And there he says, what's going on? Why are you so troubled? He say, are you a stranger in this part? Don't you know what's going on? And they invite him to come and have a meal with him. And they sit down. And Jesus opens God's words to them. He opens the history of God's time up until that point. And they break bread together. That's what he's inviting us to do in these two verses. Not just to come in, but to come in and feed us. To come in and participate with us. He's going to feed us and we're going to eat with him. So we're going to share the same sustenance, the same, the same strength that he gives to him. He's going to give back to us. These are the ones that come in and eat with him, whose endurance will be fully developed. The ones who are mature in spiritual character. Brother, these are just a few of the items that we get in lessons we get from these two verses. And tomorrow afternoon, our brother David Stein will give us, as Paul Harvey used to say on the radio, the rest of the story in verses 21 and 22. So may we continue to look at these, not as a, not as a deterrence as something we, we have done wrong, but as a roadmap and guidance and advice of how we can move forward to be pleasing to our Heavenly Father. Amen.